Today's video is by popular demand and the much requested video on whether it's permissible to use self-defense against the police. But this video comes with a number of caveats and a number of warnings which I'm going to go through now. First of all, this video is not designed or intended to encourage you to resist the police in any way whatsoever, because in doing so, you may very well land yourself in much more trouble than you may have been in the first place, or even if you weren't in trouble in the first place. Secondly, that the use of self-defense must only be with proportionate force, and that force must have been necessary in the first place. I've done other videos on self-defense, which you will find linked below, and you can go and watch those. As a broad overview of the self-defense, it must have been necessary in the first place, and it must only be force that is reasonable and proportionate, given that genuine belief of the circumstances. But another particularly stark warning that comes with this video is something that many of you may not be aware of, but many law students may have come across during their law degree, which is a bit of a quirk in the law, which crosses over with resisting arrest, obviously involving the police and some use of force from the person who is being arrested. Many of you will be familiar with a Section 18 wounding, which is known as grievous bodily harm or serious bodily harm with intent. Section 20 is the version without intent, and both of these come from the Offences Against the Person Act of 1861. Why am I mentioning Section 18, you ask? Well, this is particularly why this is a stark warning. Because Section 18 of the Offences Against the Person Act of 1861, that is intentionally wounding someone with intent, read specifically as follows. Whosoever shall unlawfully and maliciously by any means whatsoever wound or cause any grievous bodily harm to any person with intent to do some grievous bodily harm to any person or with intent to resist or prevent the lawful apprehension or detainer of any person shall be guilty of felony and being convicted thereof shall be liable to be kept in penal servitude for life. Now remember, this law was enacted in 1861, so the language is somewhat archaic, but a rough translation of that means that if you cause some serious harm whilst resisting a lawful arrest, then you will be guilty of Section 18, which is wounding with intent, and liable to life imprisonment. There is your stark warning. What this translates to is if you are resisting arrest of a police officer, and you cause serious harm to that police officer, and any defense of self-defense, which we're going to talk about in this video, but if any defense of that fails, then you may well be convicted of a Section 18 wounding, and the penalties for which are usually pretty severe. So I hope that is a stark enough warning to start off this video, but it's not all doom and gloom, there is more positivity throughout the video, so make sure you watch till the end. But first of all, if you're new to me, I'm a barrister who helps you understand law. So make sure you hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell icon and all the notifications so you don't miss anything. You can also reach me on Instagram and leave your questions here and they might get answered on my sister channel, Black Belt Secrets. And don't forget to join me for live streams. I usually do them on Sundays, but at least once a week. So now on with the video. So the question of whether or not you can use self-defense against the police is a question that has come up time and time again, particularly in response to my other self-defense videos. Now, before I get into the meat of the answer, remember the first principle of self-defense is that force must have been necessary in the first place. My starting point for self-defense is that if you can walk away, you should walk away. How does that relate to the police? Well, if you are being arrested on suspicion of doing something, then that alone is not going to be a necessary use of force if you are resisting that arrest. So again, with the warnings, that is the starting point. You will not get over that first hurdle of necessary use of force at the outset. Now, whilst it may be incredibly inconvenient for you to be arrested for something you didn't do, taken to the police station and questioned, and then released without charge because they realized they had the wrong person, or you simply didn't do what they're accusing you of doing, I would still say that is the safer option than fighting off the police officer just because you think they are in the wrong. But with all that said, let's look at what the courts have said when self-defense has been raised 
against an allegation of causing harm to a police officer. Well, as a starting point, assault on a constable is a specifically defined offence by the Police Act of 1996. Section 89 of the 96 Act specifies the offence of assault on a constable or anyone assisting a constable in lawful arrest. And that's in addition to the Section 18 peculiarity that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. But the case that pulls all of these strands together is that of Oraki and the Crown Prosecution Service of 2018. In this case, the defendant was convicted in the Magistrates Court for obstructing a police officer in the performance of his duty, contrary to Section 89 of the 96 Act. The defendant was convicted convicted in the Magistrates Court of obstructing a police officer in the performance of his duty, contrary to Section 89 of the 96 Act. He then appealed to the Crown Court, as was his right to do so, against his conviction, but the Crown Court dismissed his appeal, effectively leaving his conviction in place. He then appealed again by way of case stated. Remember this means that the Court will provide a simple summary of the facts of the case and questions for the court to answer. And a summary of the case goes as follows. The defendant, now appellant, was driving his vehicle with his mother in the passenger seat and was pulled over by two police officers. The police officers reasonably suspected that the appellant was driving without valid insurance. And in fact, he did not have valid insurance at the time that they pulled him over. The officers therefore lawfully detained the vehicle and the appellant became very upset and his mother took the keys out of the ignition. However, a short while later, the defendant's mother returned to the vehicle, got into the driver's seat and put the keys back in the ignition and had the intent to drive away. One of the officers saw her put the keys into the ignition and formed the view that she was going to start the engine and drive away. He went over to the vehicle, put his hand on her to prevent her from starting the engine, at which point she screamed out. At this point, of course, the appellant heard the screams and saw the police officer with his hands on his mother and became alarmed as to what was going on. Of course, he rushed over to the vehicle, in his mind in defense of his mother, to pull the officer off his mother because he believed that she was being injured and the second officer came over to assist the first officer. The question for the court was as follows. Is self-defense or defense of another a defense available to a charge of obstructing a police officer under section 89 of the 1996 Act? Unsurprisingly, the appellant's case throughout was that he was acting in self-defense of his mother because he was concerned for her safety as to what was happening because she screamed when the police officer had put his hands on her to prevent her from starting the engine. So after considering the material facts of the case, the Queen's Bench Division of the High Court then turned to the material legislation for a full discussion as to all of the law relating to self-defense and assaulting of police officers to determine whether or not self-defense was in fact open to the charge at hand. Of course, the starting position was to summarize section 89 of the 96 Act, where it was an offense to obstruct an officer in the performance of his duty. The court also summarized the position for self-defense in section 76 of the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act of 2008. The court then went on to discuss other cases where these issues had been raised. The first of which was Kenlin and Gardiner, which involved two 14-year-old schoolboys who were in fact innocently visiting various premises to remind their school friends of an upcoming rugby match. However, the two boys raised the suspicion of two police officers who started to question them, but the boys did not believe that they were genuine police officers even though they produced their warrant card. One of the boys tried to run away, at which point the police officer grabbed the boy and there was a violent struggle where he was punching and kicking the officer. Each boy was charged and convicted of assaulting a police officer in the execution of his duty, contrary to the old equivalent law under section 51 of the old 64 Act. However, on appeal, also by way of case stated, the court allowed the appeal and quashed the conviction, stating that it was a technical assault by the police officers and therefore self-defense was available to the two boys. The court then referenced what it said to be one of the leading works in the field of criminal law, Smith and Hogan, in which it addressed the question to what offence is public or private defence available? And with reference to this question, this text said, these defences are most naturally relied on as answers to charges of homicide, assault, false imprisonment, and other offences against the person. 
it is not clear to what extent public or private defences may be invoked as defences to other crimes. The court then looked at the judgment from Crown against Brown in 1973, from which it drew the following paragraph. Where a police officer is acting lawfully and using only such force as is reasonable in the circumstances in the prevention of crime or in affecting the lawful arrest of offenders or other suspected offenders, self-defence against him is not an available defence. The court then drew some paragraphs from the case of DPP and Bayer and others in 2003 as follows. It is a principle of the common law that a person may use a proportionate degree of force to defend himself or others from attack or the threat of imminent attack or to defend his property or the property of others in the same circumstances. A hundred years later, in the second edition of his Textbook of Criminal Law, 1983, Professor Glanville Williams said pithily at page 501 that protective force can be used to ward off unlawful force, to prevent unlawful force, to avoid unlawful detention, and to escape from such detention. The court then drew from Crown against Owen in 1970 as follows. It would be unjust if a person were deprived of the right to use reasonable force by way of defence merely because he'd made a genuine mistake of fact. The court then drew from Crown against McCoy of 2002 as follows. If a person is properly and lawfully arrested, then the use of force to free himself is unlawful. But in this case, as a matter of law, it is my responsibility to decide matters of law. I direct you that Police Constable Parker had not, in fact, lawfully arrested McCoy at that stage. And finally, the court drew again from the case of Brown and the academic text of Smith and Hogan, the following text, which sort of pull all of these arguments together. It may be respectfully suggested that this proposition is too wide. If the defendant, an innocent person, is attacked by the police who mistakenly believe him to be a gunman, and the police attack is such that it would be reasonable if the defendant were a gunman, does the law deny the right to resist? If the constable is acting lawfully, there is no reason why a person should be deprived of the defense of self-defense if he genuinely believes the existence of facts which, if true, would make the use of force by him lawful. Thus, if he mistakenly supposes that a person that has just grabbed him from behind is a robber or a thug, he may use the degree of force necessary to repel a robber or a thug, and it matters not that his assailant is in fact a police officer acting in the execution of his duty. This follows from Gladstone Williams, it should not matter that the crime of assaulting a police officer is a crime of strict liability so far as the status of the victim is concerned, because the offence still requires proof of an assault and the defence of self-defence affords the justification which prevents that element of the crime from being made out. And so the court's conclusion drawing on all of these arguments is that the defence of self-defence is, as a matter of law, a defence available to a defendant charged with assaulting a police officer in the execution of his duty. And the concluding paragraph of the judgment, which I will link below in the description, reads as follows. For the reasons I have given, I would answer the question posed for the opinion of this court in the case stated in the affirmative. The defence of self-defence or defence of another person is, as a matter of law, available in relation to the offence of obstructing a constable in the execution of his duty under section 89.2 of the Police Act 1996. Since in the circumstances of the present case in the Crown Court was of the view that if the defence had been available as a matter of law, it would have succeeded on the facts. I would allow this appeal and quash the conviction in this case. So coming back to my discussion on self-defence, I always emphasise that it is important as to what the state of mind and genuine belief of the person called upon to use self-defence is at the time in question. If that person genuinely believes a set of facts that makes it necessary to use some level of force, then that person may use reasonable force in those circumstances as he or she believed them to be. In this case in question, the appellant believed that his mother was in some kind of danger and went over to prevent her from being hurt. That was the factual matrix as he believed them to be at that time, and he believed that he was acting in self-defense of his mother. And the court agreed. The court said that if what he had believed had been true, then the defense would be available to him. So as you can see, the answer to these questions is almost never a yes-no answer or discussion. 
The amount of discussion, even what I've summarised in this video, is a very small amount of what is contained in the judgement, which I will link below if you want to read it in much more detail. And remember the stark warnings that I gave at the outset of this video. Any use of force must be necessary in the genuine belief of the person holding it, and then any such force must be reasonable and proportionate. So in the meantime, I hope you found this summary useful. Remember to like the video, add it to a playlist, share it with a friend, and as always, stay humble and please subscribe.